a golf simulator, a gym with a view above the city, their own swimming pool, the best view of Manhattan skyline, and of course, you don't have to clean up after yourself in this luxury flat chair. Like I was looking for like the place online. I remember like before I moved, and I just found this place, and I just called Kyle right away. I was like, dude, we have to live here. Like this is the place. The place is in Long Island City, not far from Manhattan in New York. Today is Music Monday in the common room of the shared apartment. There's something like this here every week, all for free. Christopher McLeod has been living here for six months. The landlords pay for the live performance. They call their concept co-living space. Chris appreciates this sort of companionship in the luxury flat share. So everyone's kind of hanging out together, so it's a very communal space and it's like it's always to meet some new people in the building. Like I remember a lot of times they'd have new people coming in that week. They'd always come to the event, you meet them all and then you just hang out. It's always a good way to meet everyone in the building. Yeah. The average age here is around the mid-twenties and everyone has a similar reason why they live here. New York, even though it's one of the busiest places, it can be one of the most lonely too, right? Because you it's a million and a half people running around, so it's good to make connections. It's also nice like, to be able to be lazy, but then have a bunch of friends in your building. With 300 residents on 14 floor, this is the largest co-living space in the USA, or as it's also known, Oli. We are allowed to visit Chris's room. I'm on the 11th floor. It's pretty nice too, because I have the Manhattan view. So, yeah, pretty solid for, a, for an apartment, I'd say. In regular shared apartments, a few steps are all it takes to reach the common room. The 24-year-old has to take an elevator ride for this. It feels more like a hotel than anything. I, I remember the first time I actually toured here, I thought, wow, am I in a hotel? Or what? It's so new looking. It's different from just a normal key, you actually just swipe it on the side and it opens. Chris shares the 150 square feet apartment with a friend. There's everything you need, but who took care of furnishing this place? This is all supplied. I, I bought this pillow because I liked it. And I also bought this comforter because I liked it. But everything you all see, see here, everything comes with the apartment. So including these, the towels, the pillows, the bed, everything. Uh, the TV comes with the apartment. The residents don't need any real transportation when they move in. What matters is you know, the convenience of just having everything already set up for me. And I'm always really busy too, so it's not like I have a lot of time to worry about customizing or decorating my furniture. I'd rather just have the convenience of it already being set up for me. So that's kind of why I liked it. You can bring your own things, of course, but you don't have to. The kitchen is fully furnished as well, even including the dishes. Everything you need is already ready from the moment you move in. It's ready to go. I think the only things we picked up at Bed Bath & Beyond were like you know, some paper towels or something. That was like pretty much it. Anyone who lives here gets the royal treatment. Even a cleaning person comes by once a week. That's hard to imagine in other shared apartments. It's kind of like hotel services, but uh, you know, it's weekly instead of daily, but I mean, for an apartment that's pretty good. I don't know, most people don't have maid service that I know. Not at my age, I mean, right out of college, that's kind of unheard of, so. Arguments over dirty dishes or the cleaning schedule with his roommate Kyle aren't a thing Chris has to worry about, which allows him to focus on other things instead of worrying about clean towels or getting toilet paper. Toilet paper is all provided, which is pretty cool. And my favorite part too is in the shower here, they like restock these, so you get your body wash, conditioner. I of course, all of this comes at a price. Chris pays $1,500 per month for the all-inclusive package. And even then, it's still cheaper than renting in New York. In Manhattan, the average rate for a shared flat is around $2,000. In Long Island City, $1,800. Living in Berlin or Munich is considerably cheaper. The apartments were kept small, so there's no living room. That way, you pay for less surface area. 
It also allows for more apartments on one floor, and more tenants, therefore. Even then, the landlord still makes a profit. Several hundred residents split the cost of the common areas as well as the gym, and for Wi-Fi and cable TV as well as the cleaning service. Property operators get big discounts since they're behind large properties with several apartments across different cities. I think it's like very well priced compared to like what you get. I mean, I know like a lot of people pay more than 15 and they're in the brownstone walk up and they don't have any amenities at all, so. It's noon. Chris often visits the roof lounge for a bite to eat. He enjoys a view that only super rich people in New York can otherwise afford. No kidding, not unless you're a billionaire or something. I mean, that's what's nice about this is it's a shared space, but it's, it's really nice and uh, the view, you can't beat it. That's what's uh, really great about Long Island City because Manhattan skyline right there. Chris manages his rent details and all communication with his landlords via an app. So this is great for reserving amenities or for doing repair requests. I've got like contact info for whoever I need to reach out to. Um, it's right in the app. So if I have a delivery too, it tells me in the app uh, I got my package and I know right away when to go pick it up. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and reserve the golf simulator because I got to get my golf on always. That's another thing you probably won't ever find in another apartment chair an in-house golf simulator, one of the many leisure activities that Chris often uses. I always tell people, like, I'm going to go golf, and they're like, you actually going to a real golf course? I'm like, no, I'm going to the fourth floor. The gym is just next door. Chris can use it at any time. There it is. I'll probably go change first. A gym of the sort can cost between $110 and $220 monthly in New York. Here, it's just another thing that is already included. And Chris doesn't even have to walk there either. In the winter, it can be really cold. You don't want to have to walk far to go to the gym. The luxury flat chair has a lot to offer. Above all, thanks to the public spaces. Chris is a programmer. Sometimes he even prefers staying at the flat chair, especially the roof lounge, than going to his real office. It's basically a huge home office to him. Um, I usually come up here to do some work. There are currently three of these co-living spaces in the United States. Six more are expected to be added in the next two years. The perfect switch. This is how a dangerous weapon can be turned into a lapdog in seconds. How does it work? These two boys here are among the best dog trainers in the world and they have their very own methods. We're off to England. This is where the training camp for super watchdogs is supposedly located. But our sat-nav can't locate the address. We have to search for a while until we finally find it in the middle of nowhere. What looks inconspicuous from the outside is an elite training center for probably the most expensive guard dogs in the world. The camp is run by two young men who have turned their passion into a profession. Robert Dye and Lidor Borland are just 30 and 25 years old, but both have years of experience as dog trainers. Lidor has even trained dogs for the Israeli military. We always get the two best of a litter of ten. So we've got him and his sister. Lidor and Robert only buy dogs that show potential for becoming super watchdogs. At the moment, they have 25 dogs in camp. These two are the youngest and only 16 weeks old. What looks like a game is a character test. But how does Train and Lidor know if a dog is good enough? You know, now the black dog, Bruno, He'll be good enough, we know already. But her, it's still 50-50. Whether she's gonna be good enough or not, she might not make a protection dog. She's the less confident one of the two. He's, got, he's more confident, he's more boisterous than play. 
So what we do with her is soon we'll let her watch everything. Mm -hmm. Everything that's happening, she'll watch and watch. But she won't get to play yeah. until she really wants to. Not like him, he wants to play all the time. She's sold just as a pet. As a family pet. As a family pet. But only if she's okay. You know, there's not going to be any aggression. We just want her to be a stable dog. We don't want to have any nervous dogs. Even as a family dog, she'll still cost around 10,000 euros. He has a very good chance of passing because he has good drive, good play drive. He's not hiding away or shy. If we ever see a shy dog or anything, they're just, we, don't, we don't train dogs like that. They have to be happy to work and happy to do the job. Lidor and Robert are internationally regarded as experts in dog psychology. Yes. Every dog, puppy, starts with this, with a rag. Only about a dozen dogs become elite guard dogs every year. And even the trainers must show full physical commitment. Because they trust their dogs completely, Lidor and Robert don't usually wear protective clothing. Puppy Bruno, in contrast to normal puppies, is not distracted by the camera or any ambient sounds. This already fulfills the minimum requirements towards becoming an elite watchdog. For him, it could be a long. Cane Corsos is a long process, maybe a year. We need to know everything about his character in case, in case he develops problems later on. We are, we, he has to be bulletproof in every way, every scenario. In one year's time, this dog could be worth between 15 and 30,000 euros and belong to a professional footballer or sheik. Let's take a look at some dogs that are already closer to this step. Advanced training. All three dogs have already been sold for 15,000 euros each. The trainers find the price reasonable. After all, they look after the dogs around the clock for at least a year and buy them from all over the world. Each dog's imported, and these ones are from Serbia. So I imported each one. I went to Serbia, I handpicked every one of these dogs myself, and that's where they've come from. Last time I was in Serbia, I think we tested 40 something dogs and didn't buy one. And they all have the workability, but they didn't have the socializing that we want. So I need to find a dog that's been brought up with a family that's not from a mass production kennel. Something that's been brought up with kids, been playing with babies all its life. The trainers mainly work with Dobermans. They're said to be perfect family dogs and guard dogs at the same time. We are still a little bit sceptical about this. I mean, you can do anything. They're totally civil. You can put your head in the mouth. It makes no difference. It's just lovely. Lucas who's for a little boy, to protect a young boy. You know, every dog has a different purpose, so we fit these dogs to different clients. And that is the most important part of their training. Trainer Lidor explains to us which tricks he uses to make the dogs obedient. You want this? So you tell him, and then you take it away from him, and you see his head stays with me, because that's where he knows he gets a reward, he's intelligent. A normal dog would go for the food here immediately. But Robert even ups the ante. So I feed the dog from, from my mouth, so it's rewarding. Also, a, um, a mother would do that to a puppy. So it, it builds a strong bond. Ah, ah, so I look. And he catches it. Hey. So he's always expecting some food from me. And he'll do that for hours. But he doesn't have to, because the boys train the dogs only a few hours a day. This is important because otherwise the animals stop enjoying their work. Watch. Here the two trainers check the so-called controllability of the dog. Doberman King has to defend his master whilst risking his own life. If he gets the command out, he must stop immediately. Close. Close. In real life, the customer must be able to rely on the dog 100%. The exercise is going well, but then the dog makes a crucial mistake. Hey, close! These dogs don't make any decisions. We make every decision for the dog. The only way you're going to have a dog 
full control is if you command it. You can never let a dog make its own decision. Remember, here the dog has made its own decision and has gone for the attacker. This must not happen. The boys have to invest an extra month of training in Doberman King. Out. Out. The cuddling at least is something he can do. If there's any doubt, he will only be a family dog and not a VIP protector. The trainers now show us their absolute super guard dog. And here he comes. Introducing Mario. He is the dog of trainer Lidor. Mario is a real master in his field. Cuddly and a fighting machine at the same time. For a cane corso, what he does is better than anything in the world I've ever seen because he's so turned on and he's so turned off, which is key. I've had people coming off of me recently. I've had 55,000 pound offered for him. I said no, and then he asked me how much more I take. I said, I'm not selling him. He said, you will. I said, I won't. But if you look through the window and see him, you're not coming in. <laughs> and if you are, you're silly. But I've never locked my house doors. So if anyone sees the video, feel free to come round. <laughs> Lido trained with Mario for 14 months. Of course, a top trained dog should not fall into the wrong hands. Therefore, the trainers choose their customers very carefully and train together with dog and owner. Out! Kiss! If I want him to kill him, he'll kill him. If I ask him to kiss him, he'll kiss him. It's my choice what I want. So it's all down to the handler what happens with this dog. But now, you see he tried killing him, and now he's trying to, now he's friends with him again. But what happens if a child accidentally gives the order? If you want to say it a million times, the kid screams watching by accident, it doesn't matter. It's the way you present the word and the way I act, my body posture, that makes him act the way he does. And you've seen how many times I just said the word with Rob's face face to face with the dog watching, watching, watching the kids. Oh, Mario is able to switch in seconds. But how do you decide when a dog is ready? Now, things are getting exciting. Doberman Enzo has spent a good year in the dog training camp and has his final big test. His task to protect a stranger. Do you want him to, um, one, attack, you know, when they asked, but they need to be calm after. When the attack's finished, then she says out, he needs to just think, okay, I'm back to walking again. I can go play. That's the main thing. Doberman Enzo has never worked with the coach's girlfriend before. Only when she says attack is he allowed to attack. A normal dog would only listen to his master. Excuse me. Give me your money now! Watch him! <laughs> Can you give me your money? Give me your money now! <laughs> he knew someone was there because he heard, but he didn't react until she told him to. He spun round, he sparked up immediately, and when she told him out, he calmed down and went down. He needs another six weeks, six weeks of training, just to finish everything off perfect, call it a polish off. He's passed, and there's already a potential buyer. But who can actually afford a guard dog for at least 15,000 euros? We usually could talk about some customers, some we've had to sign contracts for, we're not allowed to disclose who they are security reasons and just confidentiality. There's been a lot of footballers, quite a lot of footballers in England and worldwide. Um, there's been a couple of singers and there's also been some royal family and some of, there's been um, an ambassador of a country, I'm not allowed to say the country, but he bought a dog and he wants another one soon. I'd like to say who, but I'm not allowed. And how effective is such a super guard dog in real life? We're allowed to accompany the trainers exclusively to a customer who bought a watchdog for 10,000 euros some months ago. She wants to show us how the dog makes her life safer. Hi. Hello. How have you been? Hi, Izzy. It's been good. Owner Lizzie is not a millionaire. She lives alone and has been saving up for the dog for a long time. The reason? He's to protect her from a violent ex-husband. How he does it, we'll see in a moment. 
Coach Robert slips into the role of the burglar for us. Before Lizzie got the dog, her ex-husband broke into her house several times. I was living my life in constant fear. I never, just never left the house. Just like I didn't sleep, I didn't, I used to wake up like every 10 minutes and like convince somebody was there. So then that's when he was allowed to sleep on the bed after that night. And then I just started sleeping. I used to wake up and think, oh, it's all right, the dog's there, reach out for him. And then I just stopped even waking up, so. And like a month and stuff's a long time when you've not slept. It was just a hellish period of my life. Since owner Lizzie has had the elite watchdog, her ex-husband hasn't dared to enter the property again. But could Robert, as a former trainer, now turn the dog against his owner Lizzie? You cannot go for the owner. Once they have a bond, this is why we leave them for two, three weeks to bond, so they know they can never sort of attack their owner and think he's with Alicia 24-7 every day. It's just, it just wouldn't even enter his mind to attack. For Lizzie, having the super guard dog to make her life safer was definitely worth the 10,000 euro price tag. And in Ism, she's also found a friend for life. Living in a house built out of shipping containers. Luxurious and remarkable. Will this be just another trend in the US, or will we all soon be living like that? Sometimes referred to as just my big Lego set. You can be as creative as you want to be. We're in the United States, the land of unlimited possibilities. Skyscrapers as far as the eye can see. But here in Houston, these very particular luxury houses are meant to be built out of shipping containers. Director Steve Armstrong is waiting for us on the company premises. You're going to need this as we go through our tour here, so uh, okay. make sure Perfect. you uh, keep you safe. Yeah. <laughs> there are over 20 million shipping containers worldwide. The problem is they become too expensive to transport after a certain point. Steve's idea starts where others want to get rid of their containers. We felt that they're strong enough, they're resort, they're uh, flexible enough that we could really do some serious buildings with them as a, just a steel frame. Their plan? Buy large quantities of shipping containers on the cheap and build houses out of them, simply using resources already in existence. One big advantage is that all containers worldwide have the same dimensions. 40 feet long, 8 feet wide and almost 10 feet high. And practically any container can be used, no matter whether it's completely new or 10 years old. The containers get a facelift in the shop. High ceilings, big rooms, a window front. There are almost no limits. And the rust on the old steel facades? Wouldn't that be a problem? We use that to our advantage in the building side of it because uh, there are some situations which we, you can see in one of the projects working on now where we actually leave this to rust out and to, to get a, uh, what's called a rust patina. The steel facades only need to be overworked if their condition requires it, since their industrial style is what the customers ask for. Steve shows us the current container project in the next hangar. It is supposed to be ready and delivered to Baltimore within a week. Steve and his team are under great pressure because the investor sees this project as an example for the region's economic boom. It also happens to be one of the company's largest construction projects. Whoever believes these are just rectangular boxes is mistaken. Architects can get really creative with them. Well, there's many ways to finish it. You have to look at a container as just the structural frame. It's really just a steel structural framing system. You can leave it exposed like we are here, or you can clad it with any kind of material, any conventional material. We want to see what the product looks like in the end. But above all, we want to find out how they make a luxury house out of a shipping container. For this, we take a detour to New York. Less than 100 miles east, the Hamptons, 
the place where the rich and beautiful from New York prefer to spend their weekends. Here you can find luxury villas that go for several million dollars. And right in the middle there's a shipping container house. The price is almost a bargain around here. 1.4 million dollars. On the outside it looks a bit like a shipping container house. I'm curious to see what it looks like on the inside. Six containers. 185 square meters of living space. At the beginning the neighbors just laughed. But once a hurricane struck the Hamptons 10 days after it was constructed, the beach box was one of the few houses that survived. William White, active in the film industry, shows us his house. And so as you can see here, um, the side of the containers are exposed and it's an architectural design. You can still see the old sides of the containers, but other than that, it looks really like any normal house. Of course, with a special location. In the lower four containers, there are two bathrooms, three bedrooms, and, of course, an outdoor pool. An affordable luxury dream. What was your first impression when you saw this that it was house? That it was pretty amazing and that it's uh, soundproof and thermal um, and it just really, uh, just the space. And exactly this space will be created in the Houston factory. The main difference to a normal house construction is that everything happens in advance. Everything is ready before construction beings. This also includes what painter Felix has to do for work. It's just normal. <laughs> I started out building homes. I was a, was a house painter, but I ended up turning into industrial. So here I am. Yeah, I started out painting houses. So. Can you imagine living in such a shipping container house? I'm about to buy one. Over 20 employees are currently working on this project. While Felix is still painting the facade, his colleagues are busy with the interior constructions inside. This would be a good example of, of the flexibility. You know, normally a container is only nine foot six tall. Well, obviously we're gonna have much higher ceilings. We did that by opening up the ceiling and then we built these modules up top uh, conventionally so we could frame all this extra glass and get the natural lighting that you want. It's an architectural effect they're looking for. So again, you don't wanna limit yourself. If you want to expand your house later, there's no problem. Just add another container. Moving to another city but plan on keeping moving your own four walls? No problem either, because the crew around Steve will simply move the container house with them. Well, the three key advantages are speed. We set it on the foundation to do the connections. We're only there a few days, and then it's ready to use. In terms of flexibility, another major advantage, sometimes referred to as just my big Lego set, you can be as creative as you want to be. And then the cost is another advantage. Due to the short construction time, a lot of money can be saved. The erection is the fun part, I think, because you see the results. You know, it's going into its permanent location. Um, you're making it ready for the customer to have it. Um, of course, what makes that easy is what you do here. If you do it well here, and everything fits the way it's supposed to fit, then it's easy when we get on the site. The team then only notices a mistake during assembly. We'll get to that later. The crew was already able to prove a perfect structure in the Hamptons. The beach box was built within a day. It feels like a beach house mm -hmm. and it um, was pretty affordable. I have to say, it feels really cool in here. Upstairs, it does have more shipping container features, but otherwise, it's just a very cool luxury container house right on the beach, which is, of course, amazing. Earlier this year, William also figured the house could be a second source of income. He has ever since rented it out for $7,000 a week. You mentioned in the winter, it's, uh, it's no problem in the summer because of the steel, it's getting very hot inside. No, or, no? there's a membrane on the top of the roof and that's an insulation. Um, but no, there's such wind uh, through the <clears throat> summer 
that it keeps it kind of cool. Living in a container in the Hamptons definitely means living in a luxury house. And everything is just located a few steps away from the beach. Back to our house building project in Baltimore. On a former steel industry site, a new quarter for young startups is set to be built on an area of almost 3,000 acres. Affordable luxury space for young entrepreneurs and large corporations. The concept seems to work. Our container house should become the centerpiece and help attract more and more entrepreneurs to Baltimore. Today everything has to go right. Steve is stressed. Because one of the main advantages of building a container house can quickly become a problem. If the weather changes, the containers are immediately unprotected. That means a rain shower would destroy the entire interior. No major problems. A little bit of water here and there, but uh, nothing significant. Steve works with local construction companies for the project. A container house is a first for them. That's why the boss is helping out himself. It's, you know, we're a relatively small company, you know, so, uh, and probably not like it, you know, it's fun to do. It's, it's just a matter of uh, experience, but, so, doing a long time. <laughs> <laughs> the first container is the toughest one for the whole crew. If it's not located exactly where it's meant to be, the entire project will fail. Precision work with loads weighing many tons. Whoa! That's good. That's good. That's good. Happy, I can set her down. Nail it. Coming down! After being placed, the container is welded onto the foundation. And that's precisely what makes it so safe. Compared to classic American wooden houses, these container houses can withstand both hurricanes and earthquakes. It's dead level when we put it in, so that's a good sign. So now the next box, we'll try to get the building square. Right here, and then that, once that's set, all the others, you just put them up against each other. You don't have to really measure that much. Skyscrapers could not be made out of container houses. Steve believes that a total of nine boxes can be stacked on top of each other. Maximum concentration is necessary when setting them. Come to me. Yeah, like two inches. You want to line these up? Out here. Come up a little bit, John. What looks so effortless is the result of years of experience. Steve built his first container house almost 10 years ago. Failure has only made his company better and faster. That's how the first two containers are ready in less than two hours. Steve can only exhale in relief once all the boxes are welded together, however. Everything seems to be working smoothly, but of course. The last container the truck it was traveling on broke down yesterday in West Virginia. It's about 200 miles from here. So he had to get that fixed. So he's, he's running late, obviously. I uh, called this morning and said that uh, he would be here sometime around noon to 1 o'clock. That's about that time. So we're expecting him anytime. Um, but things like that happen. That means a building freeze on the construction site. Any delay increases the pressure on Steve because the containers are still not welded together and therefore not waterproof just yet. The long-awaited last truck finally arrives in the early afternoon. That's the sign the crew needs to finally finish the container office. And their main objective is achieved after less than 12 hours. The house is already standing. Yeah, very happy that uh, the, uh, the set itself went well. 
Uh, the crew was fantastic, very patient, worked with us. Steve postpones the further expansion until the next day. The weather forecast for the night is good, so he'll take his chances and waterproof the house on day two. However, there's still a lot of work to do for the team. Inside, the final works will take a few more days. Everything according to the customer's requests and following the plans of the architects. What happens on the outside and on top of the containers is also important. The crew welts the containers to metal sheets so that they are finally waterproof and windproof as well. With this final hurdle passed, Steve can finally take a deep breath and think about the future. Would be a good possibility also for Germany for building houses out of shipping containers? I think so. As far as I'm concerned, it's good anywhere. <laughs> We're anywhere. Yeah, eventually, I think we could wind up over there, but it's just so busy here that. We're focusing our energy now and resources over here, but it, there's plenty of potential there and there's plenty of application there as well. Steve and his team made it. The container house is finally standing. Another one in the US, but maybe there will be soon one in Germany as well. <laughs>